fear of love, because that doesn't make any sense to the human being. In fact, people that are on the spiritual journey, journey, it makes even less sense. It's like, why would I be afraid of love? That's the most illogical to someone who's advancing on the spiritual journey. That just seems completely illogical to be afraid of love. It's, I think, the more you just consider it, it's just absolutely baffling. Just absolutely baffling. But the, she obviously was afraid of that light. She was just holding on. She didn't know what happened. She was just holding on with her fingers and fingernails, you know, to not be, be sucked into it. And yet, I remember many years ago when I asked Jesus, what am I so afraid of? Jesus' answer was love. And I remember I said right back, very quickly, I don't understand that. Don't understand that. It doesn't make any sense to me. And so then I said, can you help me with that? Can you help me understand or help me in some way with this? Because I don't have a clue what you're talking about. And then, and then I said, okay, how about Okay, just assume that I am afraid of love, I'll, because I assume you're right. <laughs> so I will take this tact. Assuming you're right, that I'm afraid of love, then if I'm afraid of love, what is it that I'm defending and what is it that I'm protecting? And Jesus said, a self-concept that was made to take the place of the love. And so, that's what the defense mechanisms are about. The, in this case, holding on, literally holding on to the edge of the, the door or the wall to, to keep from being sucked into the light. Um, in psychological terms, you could think about denial and repression and projection and and on and on, sublimation and all of the defense mechanisms that, that they have in psychology and psychiatry. But, but basically, the most important thing to start to realize is that what is being defended is a false identity, is a self-concept that was made to take the place of truth, made to take the place of love. And that, I said, well, thank you, that I can I have an, an inkling of what that's about. I don't fully know what you mean, but I can relate to that. Because this identity that I've clung to, it definitely doesn't seem to be totally loving or, or created by God. And so that gave me inroads to kind of say, Okay, now I'm going to be shown by the Spirit how to expose and reveal what it is that I believe I am and what it is that I'm identified with. And I read in the Course the line, Whenever you feel the need to become defensive about anything, you have identified yourself with an illusion. So that was helpful. That was like, oh, now I have an inroads. You've identified yourself with an illusion. And from what we're talking about tonight, then, then the goal is to simply uncover and expose everything that the mind is, is identified with in this world, with the goal of seeing it as all the same, not seeing it as different. Just seeing it as all the same. Yeah. It's everything. That would be a good use of this seeming six weeks. It's just, if you just spent every day, or even just a, a small portion of every day, just pondering, what is it that I am identified with in this world? That would be a very very helpful use of time.
And would you know by defensiveness? Would, would that be the only clue? Yeah, that would be the clue. Which is great because with a group of us here, you know, you can just then watch whenever any defensiveness arises around anything. It could be seemingly a compliment, it could be a criticism. Maybe there's a compliment. Somebody says, I like your hair, and you feel just a little awkwardness <laughs> around, I like your hair. Or it could be anything. Or it could be a criticism, I don't like your hair. Or something where you, where you feel that little niggling of defensiveness, then, then you have an inroad. Then you really have a great opportunity for, for true forgiveness, because you're getting in touch with something that you still identify with as real, that's not. Yes, we'll probably still be singing Beatles songs. Uh, <laughs> you know, all you need is love, 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 da, 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 love, love. We do that a lot anyway. But, I'm just saying if you just even use part of the day, just part of the day, to ponder and the best parts are the times when you notice a little defensiveness. Mm -hmm. Now that's practical. Mm -hmm. You can go, actually it's kind of fun to go through the whole day, you know. La 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 la, live for today. Hey. <laughs> la 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 la, live for today and don't worry about tomorrow anyway. That's actually how you can live your life. You can live your life in the la la la, but if you notice some defensiveness coming up, then ah, that sneaky ego, that insidious ego, ah, gotcha. <laughs> then you got like a thread, you can follow it in. Hmm, I'm noticing some defensiveness here. Oh, hmm. <laughs> ha, ha, ha. <laughs> like Sherlock Holmes. Hmm. <laughs> here we go. <laughs> Got a little thread there. So that's good, you know. <laughs> yeah. That's what I did. I mean, you know, it's all nice to love, love, love stuff and all is God, all is love. But I mean, really, it's like if, if you could just accept that, then you wouldn't need a spiritual path. Certainly wouldn't need a course of miracles if you could accept that. So, so then you actually look at it's more like the Eastern neti neti, not this, not that. But how do you know what the knot is, where the knot is, <laughs> until you find a little defensiveness arising? Mm -hmm. Then it's like ah, uh -huh. mm hmm, mm hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you can be like Sherlock, as soon as you get on to that little, little niggling, then it's like, Watson, come here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think that's the best way to see it is that it's a journey of, of discovery and you're discovering everything that is not the truth. Truth is approached through negation. You know, anyone who just thinks that just, I'm going to affirm myself back to the truth, it's actually approached through negation. You have to see Everything that the truth is not, which is just what the ego is. You have to, that's another way of saying you must expose the ego. You can't keep part of the ego hidden and part of the ego exposed and expect to be free of the ego. The part that's exposed, it's like, hmm. And then the, the part that's not exposed is the ego is laughing down there. <laughs> Still gotcha. But it's the total exposure the total netty netty. So, how do you know when the total exposure, isn't there always more hidden? Down there? 
Yeah. Well, it, it has to come to an end. That's the smile on Truman at the end before he goes out the exit door. There has to come a, a point, you know, where there's the metaphor of right mind, wrong mind, which is the coarse metaphor, finally has to dissolve as well. In fact, I had a woman at the conference came up and she said, I've been involved with non-duality for like 30, 30, 40 years. And she said, I've got a lot of non-duality friends who, uh, every time I talk about A Course in Miracles and choose again and choose to be right-minded and choose the atonement and everything, they go, no, 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 no. No. Choice is an illusion. And she said, hmm, this, this came up to me when I was uh, in Armel's group that time. I think they recorded it. All these, this course group was going along working with the course, and then one of the women came and brought a, an, a, a different book in, a Data Vedanta book, and it was just dispelling, of course, dispelling everything, dispelling choice. And so she said, we've all been fooled by this Course in Miracles. <laughs> there is no Holy Spirit. There is no right mind, wrong mind. There's only the One, and we've been fooled. There, we don't need 365 lessons and a mind training program. It's all one. It's right here in the book. I read it. The book told me so. <laughs> and they all went around and they said yes. So the group had basically rebelled against the Course. Or they might say, we have transcended A Course in Miracles, mm -hmm. everything. And I just kind of sat and listened to them for 20-25 minutes. I said, so how do you feel? <laughs> I said, what do you mean? I said, how do you feel? Well, I don't know. I don't know. Feelings aren't real either. Yeah, but how do you feel? Well, I said, do you have perfect happiness? Well, no, but that's why we're studying this new book. <laughs> So we had to, we had a whole discussion about it's the how do you know it's when the metaphor of right mind wrong mind experientially it dawns on the mind that healing is all inclusive all encompassing it doesn't have an opposite there's not a an aspect of the mind that's healed and an aspect that's not healed. You can't have partial healing, just like you can't be partially pregnant. You, you know, that's the recognition that this is all about. Is it a feeling? Oh yes. Is it a state of mind? Oh yes. Is it a perception? Yes. Do you still see the world? Yes. Is there anything, is there, are there any opposites? No. Are there any parts? No. Is there an inner and an outer? No. Mind is all-encompassing. Is the world outside of your mind, or the mind? No. Is there anything outside of the mind? No. Krishnamurti was a beautiful teacher, and one of his teachings was I am the world, and the world is me. He was just teaching that 
experience that there's there aren't separate worlds and there's not as the cosmos is not separate from the mind it's all you could call it consciousness that's unified consciousness is probably a better way of saying it so I, we come back to Truman show that's the example of him that big grin on his face it's like he can't hold it in and that's, that's what it's about.